our planet, our response is looking at the main causes of biodiversity loss around the world, the importance of biodiversity, and how you can be part of a solution to combating the biodiversity crisis. Let's take a look at Aaron's response. I'm Aaron Moran, a biologist, photographer, and filmmaker. I'm fascinated with the natural world and always looking for exciting and engaging stories which explore our relationship with wildlife. I've only recently started exploring invasive species and their effects on biodiversity, but the more I've found out, the more I've realized how devastating non-native invasive species can be on our ecosystems. In this episode, we want to take a deeper look at some of the common non-native invasive species that can be found in our local area and find out why they have such a damaging effect on biodiversity. These are all examples of non-native invasive species. And they can range from plants to animals to fungi. But what makes an organism a non-native invasive? First of all, you need to define the difference between a, a native and a non-native species. So a native species is one that has become part of an ecosystem through natural processes. So they haven't got there with any human intervention. Whereas non-native species are those that have been moved outside of their range by human activity. And then some of these non-native species are able to reproduce and when they start reproducing and spreading beyond the introduction site, that's often when they start being called invasive species. As the human population has grown and found ever faster ways to transport goods, so is the potential for us to carry unwanted visitors with us wherever we go. Ships can carry aquatic organisms in the ballast water. Smaller boats may carry them in the propellers, Meanwhile, insects can get into wood, shipping pallets and crates, which are then shipped across the world. Accidental introductions are those that have, we've moved them here, but not on purpose. So a really good example of that is rats, which have now hitchhiked all over the world on boats. And then there's those that are introduced intentionally. So this could be for food. So for instance, crayfish were introduced uh, to lots of parts of the world for consumption, the ornamental trade, so for instance plants that people want in their garden. The final one would probably be the pet trade, so in the sort of 1800s grey squirrels were fashionable to have as pets and so that's why we have them here now because they're, they're not native to the UK, they're native to North America. It almost seems like an impossible task to prevent certain species from becoming invasive. I'm in what you call your typical pond with a film crew looking at a bunch of plants. Well, not any bunch of plants. If you live in the UK or mainland Europe, chances are at some stage you might have come across plants like these. This is Himalayan balsam. It might seem like a fairly attractive plant, but this is a major weed problem, especially along our riverbanks and often in our gardens too. As you can see here, it pretty much dominates the understory of this woodland. And when we say non-native, it originates all the way from the Himalayas, specifically around Kashmir. It was initially brought here as a garden plant back in 1839, but soon escaped gardens becoming an invasive. Remember, in our planet, our response, we're talking about the major drivers of biodiversity loss. So how do these and other invasive species reduce biodiversity? Invasive species are a huge problem for biodiversity because they are coming into an area where they themselves don't have any predators. There's no checks and balances, and they can then act as a top-down influence on everything else in the ecosystem. So as an example of one of the species that I worked on, we have Burmese pythons that are now wild in the Everglades. I mean, this is the skull of one individual snake, which, you know, it's could be about 20 feet long, is now in the Everglades eating all of the native rats, raccoons, possums, all the mammals. It, it can eat a deer, but it's having a huge impact on the native wildlife in the area. And, and those are individuals, those are species that are found nowhere else on the planet often. So if it wasn't because of this introduction, we would have a lot more species still roaming around in Florida. Another example is the cane toad, which was introduced to Australia in 1935 to combat cane beetles that were thriving on Australia's sugarcane crop. Their hardy nature and voracious appetite 
was initially an appealing quality to farmers, but soon led them to become prolific invaders. They completely failed at regulating the cane beetle population and instead turned their attention to other native insects and continue to this day to threaten the food sources of other native animals, as well as, of course, our own crops. A population that started from a mere 3,000 toads is now into the millions spreading across Australia and other nearby warmer climes. Bringing us back here to the UK, common invasive plants such as Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam can have huge knock-on effects on our local ecosystems. As the plants outcompete our native flora, we lose much of the beautiful native flora species we like seeing, so essentially we're left with areas which look a little bit desolate and void of life. We also lose the insects and other local critters which rely on these native plants either for food or for reproduction. Now, that probably sounds like a pretty grim reality, but this series is all about exploring ways in which we can all help in preventing situations like this from happening. So, what can we do? One of the easiest and simplest things that we can all do to help prevent the spread of invasive species is regularly clean any equipment that we've used outdoors. This could be boots, wellies, boats, paddleboards, and any other equipment you might be using. Give them a quick rinse and dry them before bringing them back home, as this helps remove insects and plant parts that may spread invasive species to new places. All you have to do is not carry plant and animal material with you from place to place. And, and that can be simple too, like don't take firewood from one place to another place. Definitely don't release any unwanted exotic pets. So if you have any exotic fish or reptiles, you can't release them into the wild because they could end up becoming invasive. If you want to go that one step further, recognising which plants and animals are invasive, even just a few, can help stop the spread of invasive species. As with everything, there are books and apps that help identify and report an area where you found invasives, and also to help make sure you're not introducing any invasives into your own garden. What you can all do is you can start learning about the plants and animals in your own yard. If you're in a city, in your own city block, because I guarantee you there are invasive species that are around you that you can help tend to. Please keep a keen eye out for volunteering groups near you, which help in removing species like this. Whichever level of involvement you decide to go for, every effort is a big help in the fight against invasive species and preventing biodiversity loss. The great news about invasive species and trying to restore things to native habitats is that everyone can do it. Please make sure to share these tips with friends, family, essentially anyone you know. Each of these small behavioural changes in our day-to-day -day lives can end up having a huge impact on our local biodiversity and paving the way for combating the biodiversity crisis. This is our response. What's yours? We've got more suggestions for combating the invasive species crisis. These can be found on the Eek Sapien and Earth Minutes Instagram accounts, so follow us to find out more. Links in the description below. And also be sure to let us know if you have any other ideas for tackling the biodiversity crisis.